So find your voice and just jump in, right? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes yeah, jump yeah. in to find your voice. <laughs> right. As long as you got your action slacks on, you should be all set. All right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You're listening to Craft Leftovers. I'm your host, Kristen M. Roach, a classically trained artist, author of Mend It Better, and creator of three thriving product-based businesses, Art, Craft, and Tea. Okay, hold on a second. I have a feeling that you're... that you're just going to be, like, dropping this amazing knowledge this entire time we're talking. Get some notes. (laughs) Get your notes, girl. Get your notes. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Legit. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess my first question is, do you have any questions for me? So what is the desired outcome of the um, interviews that you're doing? I kind of want to show like how you might start out on a creative path and think that you know exactly what you should be doing and what it should look like, but that it'll grow and evolve over time. And that's okay, and that can be really beautiful, and it can actually lead to lead to things that are better than you ever hope to achieve in the beginning. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> very interesting because we're walking very, very parallel paths, and I think that we can talk about that during the interview. I mean, yeah, that's what so, I was hoping for. Yeah, with yeah. our connection of like using recycled and upcycled materials, as well as just like this kind of like long relationship with craft and art and right. and that kind of thing. First, thank you so much for joining me today and like giving me a chance. Cause like I said, I don't have a huge audience at this point anymore. And so like taking your time and taking a chance on me in this project, I really appreciate it. Ah. Um, You're, I'm, <laughs> I just, so, I'm so flattered. I mean, honestly, it's like, I think that, and I think that's about a lot of our kind of uh, the, the craft industry in general, I feel like we are all here to support each other and I'm happy to support you. And I, I feel very well supported by you and others and, you know, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for reaching <laughs> out and thanks for including me in your book for going to sakes way back whenever 2009. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so first I just want to kind of give you the floor. What, what can, what do you want people to know about you and what can you tell us about yourself and just whatever comes to mind? Okay. Um, well, my name is Crispina French and, um, it looks like a whole bunch of typos, but it's not. Um, and I live in Beckett, Massachusetts and, um, kind of very close to where I grew up in, um, the Berkshire Hills. And I started, both of my parents were artists. They were both um, high school art teachers. So when I graduated high school with, um, a lot of like C minuses and two A's in the art classes that I took, I was pretty convinced it was because they were my art teachers. (laughs) Um, but I went on to art school and when I was in, um, art school, I started making toys actually out of recycled wool sweaters. And, Um, I was a little bit upset with my parents because we have a family business called the Dolphin Studio that is a screen printing business. We print, it's, the legacy is carried on and I'll tell you more about that in a little bit, but it's, um, they're printed on paper, hand prints. And growing up, it was, we make a calendar and it was like, you know, our chores, we didn't go milk the cows, but we did go print the Marches or the Aprils or whatever month we were working on. And it was our job as kids in the household to contribute to that. We made designs, we each designed a month every year. And then we also did the actual labor of the printing process. And, you know, I was told like, you're not going to get paid, but you are going to get college. And then when I went off to college, they were like, oh, you know, it's so expensive. And I was like, they actually raised me um, believing that I was poor. And I thought it was poor because, you know, when your parents tell you something that you just believe that. And then when I went off to college in Boston with people who actually were poor, um, I was so upset with them. I was like, I am so privileged and I've got this, like so many opportunities available to me. I am not poor. And I was really... um, just, I mean, maybe angry is not the right word, but I just wanted to prove to them that like, I really didn't need them. Like I really, if you're poor, please keep your money because you need it. And I worked my way through school. And if I hadn't done that, I would have not be who who I am today. I, I feel like it was almost like, you know, the teenager, like flipping their parent off kind of behavior, but I worked my way through college. I I worked three jobs. I went to school full time. I worked my tail off. And um, when I realized like my schedule was so demanding that 
when I started making things to sell, I could do that around the other commitments I had. And I, that I was able to like diminish the other commitments because it was, it began to pick up steam. And I actually, hold on one second, just let me lean over this way. These two ragamuffins are vintage. Um, people send me back their ragamuffins when their kids go off to college or like get married and have their own kids. Like, you know, I mean, that's cool. Yeah, it's really cool. But I don't really make a whole lot of ragamuffins anymore because they actually hurt my hands after mm. sewing through all those layers of fabric. But so, you know, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. Um, I went to college, I graduated college, I had no debt. And I thought, you know what, rather than trying to figure out what I'm going to do for work, I think I'm just going to do this. And I was able to focus, you know, my full time attention on building a business. And I really didn't know that's what I was doing. I know that sounds really silly, but I didn't like sit down and go, I'm going to write a business plan and I'm going to start a business. But my mother actually kind of pushed me. She kind of said, you know, you're doing this cool stuff. People have like a nice response to it. Like, why don't you just think about maybe selling them at a show? So I applied to the American Craft Council show, which was near where I lived in Western Mass. It's um, at the um, West Springfield was the show. And mm -hmm. they don't actually do that show anymore, but I got in. And, you know, I was waiting tables. It was, you know, right, right after I graduated college and I sold $24,000 worth of product in a matter of a couple of days. And I quit my job waitressing <laughs> and yeah, uh, <laughs> the people I worked for were like amazing, super supportive. Like it was like June in the Berkshires, which is like right at the beginning of our busy season. And I was like, I can't, I just can't. And they were like, no problem. Go do your thing. If you need help, call us. And I called them because I didn't know the first thing about running a business. Um, two years later, I had 40 employees and I still really didn't know what I was doing, but I did it and it worked out. And somebody told me along the line, as long as there's more money coming in than going out, you're doing it right. <laughs> and that's, you know, Crispina's business tactic in a nutshell is like, you know, make more than you spend and you're doing all right. So after, you know, I ran a, a 40 person production company for 22 years and in 2008, I just decided I didn't really want to do that anymore. I had two young kids. I have three children and my son is 13 years older than my older daughter. So when he was a little one, I was a single mom and I could bring him with me. I was traveling to trade shows all over the country. And then I got married and had two young kids and I didn't really want to do that again. It was just really hard. And I was outnumbered by small children. <laughs> it's just like, you know, there must More be kids in your hands. Life. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, by this time, Ben was like, you know, off on his own, like doing, you know, going to school, like he was actually living with his dad at that point. So, um, I changed my path and that's actually when I published my book, I published a teaching book and I started doing a lot of teaching, mostly in person and realized that, there's kind of two things I love most about my method of working. And one is that it's super accessible. You don't need a lot of tools. You don't need a lot of experience. You don't need to have a huge workspace. You can be pretty um, poor, as my mother would say, um, and get started. Like there's not a huge investment. And um, the other thing that I really love about it is that it's very portable. So like if you're a young mom and you're, you know, you got your kids at the beach or you're on a play date or whatever, you can kind of bring it with you. So in teaching, I realized that because I was like in a spot, you know, a specific location and I was doing in-person teaching, it was really hard for people who didn't have a lot of money to come. So a couple of years before the pandemic, I started teaching on Zoom, which <laughs> makes me feel like I'm super savvy, which I'm actually really not. But um, <laughs> it was a really great opportunity for me to reach out to people who could, you know, put together the tuition money, but could not get away from their families or, you know, have the expense of traveling and being away from their regular grind to um, take a course. So that was a really great opportunity for me to kind of just expand my reach and be more accessible to more people. Um, and I've, you know, I've done that for a few years and, and I'm the kind of person I love to learn. I'm always like learning, developing, trying, like my kind of baseline is to 
increase the positive impact I can have in textile recycling in the world. Like uh, most people have very little knowledge or awareness of the vast mess of our overconsumption of textiles. And I don't like to be the finger wagging person going like, we're going to hell in the handbasket people. Like, what are you doing? Um, I think that it really causes a lot of anxiety. It makes people feel guilty for being human. Like my spin is to just be like, you have the power to make change. And, you know, creativity has been scientifically proven to increase self-esteem and decrease stress and anxiety. And so the combination of being creative and addressing a pretty significant global issue um, just adds a level of meaning to people's craft and, and, and then business, if that's the route they choose to take, um, that it has, it just, it like feeds you. It like feeds you um, like you're doing the right thing. And it's easy to see that. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. I love it. So many of the things you said, I was like, yes, that was me. <laughs> like I, yeah. I think I'm probably about 10, 10 or so years younger than you, but it was, I'm like, yes, I'm like a decade behind you. And that was me. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, 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 like the, the experience with your parents and the, having the three jobs in college and that the way that you thumbed your nose or stuck up your middle finger at your, at you know, your youthful rebellion was basically going to college despite everything and paying yeah. it your own way. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. Like at the height of craft leftovers, when I was doing like panel conferences in Chicago and whatever, and getting into magazines for the first time, and I was still in art school and working three jobs. <laughs> Which yeah. I'm like, how did I do that? I don't know. Yeah, yeah you just did it because it, and it's so it. fun, right? It's so it was fun. So and it's so fun. It's so exciting. And it's like, it's like, you know, when you get a response that's positive to your work, no matter how old you are, but I think especially when you're like that, that kind of malleable, like becoming an adult age, it's like, you know, that you're on the path that feeds you, right? Like it's, yeah, you know, when I belong to a, couple of different coaching groups. And a lot of the people in my groups are people who have come to their professions after doing something they really didn't like for a long time. Right. And I've never done that. <laughs> I've <laughs> never done anything that I really don't like. I mean, in work, there's been plenty of, right. you know, whatever, changing diapers is not that much fun, but sure. you know, as far as like work goes, and I feel like there's something kind of like, you know, I never thought that I really knew how to run a business. And then I look back, I'm like, well, I've been doing it for 30 something years now. So I guess I'm still I doubtful. Do and when yeah. people come to me and say, so how do I start a business? How do I run a business? I'm like, why are you asking me? Right. right. <laughs> so like, Same. I think a, li a little bit of this podcast uh, series is, is legit. Like trying to add, it, it's me embracing the fact that, oh, maybe I do actually know something about running a business. Well, you know what's happened for and me. I have something to offer. Yeah. Well, the, the, yeah. the thing is that joining my coaching group um, a couple of years ago really opened my eyes to, yeah, I actually do know how to run a business. And yeah, I went to art school and no, I've never taken any kind of formal business education, but, um, and it sort of sounds silly, but going back to that sort of flippant comment that my boss, I worked at a gallery for a short while and the gallery boss told me that like when you're running a business, as long as you're making more money than you're spending, you're doing it right. And yeah. if that's what it boils down to, it's really very simple. And people tend to get really complicated with it. And of course, you know, there's complexities that are sure sort of intrinsic in each individual, you know, it makes sense for some people to have some kinds of complexities where other people might have different ones, but, um, the thing that I'm really super jazzed about right now, which is my kind of, um, so, so screen printing, I'll back up to where we left off with that. So sure. the family business, Dolphin Studio, fast forward 52 years, because <laughs> it's actually a 52 year old company at this point. Both of my parents have passed. 
my sister and I both have kids and we continue to make the calendar. So now we're the ones going, make the screen prints. <laughs> and um, <laughs> oh, the, no. is done. Um, the difference is that we pay our kids when they're working. And um, we also have grown the business quite a bit. So we, we screen print anywhere. Like this past season, we sold 3,500 calendars that are all hand screen printed. Um, if you look over my shoulder, they're on the wall back yeah. there. Um, they look that's far away. So they're 12 yeah, by 20. I know it. Um, so I, you know, every year I did this thing and, you know, I'm 56 years old. I've been doing this for a really long time. Every year I would get like my knickers up in a twist about, oh my God, I have to do all this work for the dolphin studio. And it's my busy season. Cause I make blankets out of wool and why, whoa, what am I supposed to do? And I just mm. had this like epiphany come to me this past year, like 2021, where I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing like making myself insane when calendars, you cannot sell calendars in February. They're never going to sell in February because they're calendars. So I just stopped what I was trying to do. And I realized that the best use of my time where I can have the most beautiful days is to focus all my energy on the Dolphin Studio during calendar sales time. And then do something opposite that, that feeds me with my textile recycling business. Mm -hmm. So in April, 2022, we are going to launch the very first Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Summit. Yes, I'm so excited about this. Oh, you and have no idea. I am so, I, I, every, I just, I mean, I, somebody pinched me, honest to God. Like, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah. how did you come up with this idea? So, well, I'm a people person. I mean, like one of the things I loved about my young life was waiting tables. And most people think that I'm crazy when I say that, but you can learn so much about people and develop your people skills and your business skills. My whole thing was that I would give me the grumpiest people in the restaurant, put them in my section because I'm going to make them have a really good time and I'm going to make them give me a ton of money. And it, it, it's like a game. It's like a game, right? So like I was able to create the space for people and have them have like a, a memorable, beautiful experience, even when that was the last thing in the world that they thought was possible. So um, some of the miserable people, let me just tell you, they still were miserable and they did not have fun, but it was my goal. Um, so you know, I have always liked to kind of connect with other people and promote what other, you know, what I'm doing. And, you know, when I wrote my book, people thought it was nuts. Like, what are you doing? You have a business and you're going to teach people how to have a business like yours. And I was like, do you understand how much textile waste there is in the world that needs to be recycled? Like, I don't really have time to do. There's a lot that. of room. There's a yeah. lot of room for other yeah. people. Right. I'm, um, I'm like the abundance kind of thought process person. Like, there is never going to be too many people recycling textiles. There is never going to be too many, you know, yoga teachers or, you know, meditation teachers or restaurants serving delicious food. There's just never going to be like, it's so hard to stay in that mindset though. That's, it's amazing. It's something I strive for, but I have to be honest. I'm not always there. Well, you know, life <laughs> events kind of teach you along the way, right? Like you have, like, yeah. There's always choices. You were always, you, I mean, I have had some pretty crazy things, you know, make me go, I could be having a really shitty day today or I could not. And just yeah. knowing that there's this edge, this like abyss that you walk next to through your whole life. And there's always the opportunity to jump in. There's always mm -hmm. that there, but to just go like, nope, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to, I'm going to just, today is a good day. And it's, you know, so, um, I, I love to promote other textile upcyclers. I feel like there's this huge uptick and awareness of our excessive consumption. I feel like, I kind of feel like the pandemic brought that on to, to a degree mm -hmm. where people, you know, I remember when the pandemic first came about and like, there was these pictures of like, you know, new Delhi or like Beijing where people could like see a view because the air yeah. was cooler. And I just think like those images implanted in brains around the world. And it wasn't just that air that got cleaner. It was like, everybody was consuming less. Nobody was driving as much. And it was mandated because of this terrible 
you know, thing, COVID. Yeah. But there was this sort of silver lining where people sort of grew their awareness of the impacts that we as humans kind of don't even realize we're having, right? So I wanted to bring people together to celebrate that. And I wanted to just be a person who could celebrate and 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 also you know i realized along right around the time where i realized that like i didn't really have to make blankets in november that i could do that at other times of the year um i i was doing a lot of like interviewing of the people who follow me you know like mm. what do you what can i provide to you that's most valuable what what can i what are you looking for in me right? Mm -hmm. And the resounding, the resounding reply, which was shocked me was that they all wanted to learn how to make a business. <laughs> all of them. They all wanted, no, they didn't need to know how to make pot holder rugs. They didn't want, I mean, yeah, they like to know how to make pot holder rugs, but what they really want to do is make pot holder rugs so that they can sell them and have a living that they love. And yeah. So I kind of pivoted and I kind of was like, oh, you guys want to learn this? Well, I'm not the only teacher and I'm not, you know, my way of doing things works really well for me, but there's like this world of people doing all kinds of amazing work in this very yeah. kind of super niche down arena of textile upcycling that are also teaching by example every day. And so I kind of, the summit came out of that mindset of just wanting to provide information to sort of aspiring environmental healers, if you will, yeah. using textile upcycling as their method of nurturing. Um, so that's where it came from. Wow. I love that. I, what you just said there about, um, how did you phrase it? Textile upcycling as their way of healing. That's just it's beautiful. I think it's also really freeing. Uh, one of the core beliefs I've had for a long time is that as humans, we're all kind of wired differently. And some of us are really geared towards um, oh, just like caring for different segments of the world, right? Like, so some people are humanitarians, like they're very into like the humans, and others are very into the plants <laughs> and that kind the of labels, thing, the environment, right? yeah, the yeah, land, yeah, yeah. yeah and, and everything in between. And so I think some people feel a little bit of guilt about like, I should be out there doing X. And it's like, well, anything you choose, any path you choose can have a really beautiful healing impact in our world. It doesn't yeah. have to be what somebody else is doing. Yeah. And it yeah. doesn't even have to be like outside of your own existence, right? Like, you yeah. know, if you think about how you are in the world and you just, just, just moment, just for a moment, imagine like, you know, what, what do you actually need? Right. Like mm. I just recently had a conversation with my daughter. One of my, I have, my daughters are 15 and 16 years old. So you know, homecoming dance. And she's, you know, 16 and 16 is, I would not want to be a teenager again for all the tea in China. Like there's just, me neither. You know, <laughs> oh, it's awkward. And, I, and it's now hard. I, yeah, it's hard. It's a hard, it's just like that age from like, I think it's like, like 12 to 13 to like 20 or 22 maybe. Yeah. But so she was, she wants to go to the homecoming dance. Of course, you know, she's my kid. So I'm like, okay, great. Let's go to the, you know, vintage clothing store that my girlfriend owns with lots of really beautiful dresses from like, you know, all the eras back to the 1940s, you'll find something. And sure enough, no, 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 no. And she wound up buying a dress from Shein online for $13. Well, you know, this is my kid and I need her to be comfortable in herself. I need her to be comfortable at this dance. You know, I, tried to inspire her to shop in a conscious manner. And she chose with the information I provided to not do that. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Like there's not, I'm not going to shame her for doing that. I'm not going to like make her feel like a bad person, but we need the information. We need to share the information so that people can make choices. Her choice was based on comfort. Like she wanted to look like all the other kids. She didn't want to yeah. stand out. She didn't want to wear a 1940s vintage dress from the coolest store on the planet. She wanted to look like everybody else and everybody else is wearing this crap. So 
my thought that's is that's really like, important at 16. It's so important. It's the most important, right? So then my thought is like, how long will it take us as a people to change that? So that the 16 yeah. year old kids are feeling comfortable with what we all need to do so that we have air to breathe and water to drink and healthy people around us. Right. Like, mm-hmm. and it's, you know, without, without like causing any kind of like, um, environmental anxiety, which is real. It's now, now is a really good time to start really thinking about everything that you bring in, in that you consume. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think a, another really big thing that happened at the beginning or mid shutdown was, uh, people were home a lot and they yes. were surrounded by their stuff. Yes. I mean, I know I was, yeah. mm-hmm. I, and, uh, my business was thus that we actually saw a huge uptick. So I guess I, I was home, but I was kind of working more than ever, but I know for my parents, my sister, a lot, a lot of their friends, they were home they were surrounded by their stuff and they started peeling off these layers of what's unnecessary. And it freed up actually, it just straight up freed up cash of like, if they weren't consuming all these other things, they could afford things that they valued more that had more staying and lasting power in their lives. Because on the one hand, we can all say that um, disposable clothing is bad, but when you have $20 to spend, and you want to go get yourself a new shirt, sweater, pants, whatever. Even when you go to the thrift store now, or like a cool vintage shop, like you mentioned, like you can also go to like H and M and get the same, if not even more, clothing by article. That's like current trend. You know, you can you can fit in. You can be like a part of society through your clothing choices. And that's really hard. It's really hard to choose the different path. It's really hard to like put your money, like to say, okay, I'm going to buy one nice sweater instead of a sweater, two shirts and a pair of pants, you know, like that's hard. Like that is a hard choice. Right. And I know that's something like I faced, um, in, in college and things. And, and I grew up thrifting and things like that, but it was still, it's still hard to like, say, okay, I can buy this used thing for $5 or I can get this brand new thing for $5. What do I, what do I do? And, you know, through experience, I've learned that the $5 thing, oftentimes the used older $5 thing that's not made to be disposable will oftentimes last longer than the thing that was made to be disposable. That was made to like essentially risk recycle into like, you know, like turnover in your wardrobe right. for the yeah. next year's trend. Yeah. Yeah. And that's- yeah. It's fast fashion is a thing that, you know, you hear that yeah. a lot, like fast fashion. A lot of people don't realize the depth of it. And it's, um, again, like shaming is never productive, but it's certainly something that, um, it's getting, it's getting addressed, you know, it's, there's, there are people working really hard to, bring accountability to the manufacturers who have this business model that's just completely unsustainable on any level. So um, that, you know, over time, I think what will happen is that those $5 or new items will not be $5 anymore because the people who are making them will actually demand to be paid um, yeah. more than, and just there, there's so much exploitation and just, just wrong, bad, greed, not good people in that the business model is just skewed. It's not, it's not a healthy business model. So, no, you know, no. as the, hopefully we'll, that'll come to light in, in a, on a larger scale. I think it will. And I think it's starting to, and it's something like, you know, like you said, you can kind of choose where you focus your energy, where you, you focus your attention and you can choose to, to think about this, like we're all doomed and going to hell in a handbasket, like you said, <laughs> or you can think like, it is getting better. We are making an impact. We are as a human race, you know, as humanity, we are, we are moving forward and we're growing and we're becoming more conscientious and we're being better stewards. You know, it's, yeah, I'd like to think that way statistics because that's not what they show you, but there, there (laughs) are, there's more awareness. There's 
there's, I mean, the statistics are kind of horrifying, pretty daunting, but um, we're definitely not at a place where we have a balance, like the fast fashion oh. continues to explode. The good, the good statistics that I like to look at are things like in 2025, um, the sale of used clothing will surpass the sale in dollars of fast fashion by the year 20, That's exciting. by the year 2030, it's forecast to be double that of fast fashion. So the sale of used and, and secondhand clothing will be double the volume of sales to fast fashion. So, you know, that, that arc looks really good to me, that, that arc. And if you're going to buy secondhand clothing, it's got to be, you know, the fast fashion sort of stuff doesn't really cut it because they're not designed to be worn very much. So, you know, if you want to have good quality stuff in your thrift stream, think about that when you're buying clothing, because if you buy good clothing, it makes it to the thrift stream and serves yeah. other people. Yeah. A lot of consignment shops won't actually take fast fashion lines for that yeah. very reason is that they can't re the price they have for it to sit, take up shelf space in their store, the price that they have to sell it at is oftentimes as much or more than when it's new. It's just not like, it doesn't make good business sense for the consignment and thrift stores. So, right. Right. So there's a really good book about all of this. And actually um, it's written by a woman named Maxine Bedat. I think that's how you pronounce her name. It's B-E-D-A-T. And um, she has um, an organization, a not-for-profit organization that's called the new, um, oh darn, what is it called? It's anyway, I'll look it up put, later and I'll yeah. put it in the show notes. Yeah. Her book is called Unraveled and it's just a oh, really, it's a, it's, you can listen to it. She there, she has it on um, audiobook as well. It's just a super informative book about the life cycle of a garment and what cool. is actually happening with that. And it's, it was really very educational, really nicely written. It's not too long. So it's kind of, you know, it's not a, it's not too dense, but it's, it's not really, a tome. Yeah, no, no. Um, <laughs> So yeah, and she'll actually be at the um, at the summit presenting. So she'll um, be able to share more about her mindset and just how she came to this. You know, one thing that I kind of wonder about a lot is like, how on earth did I get to be so passionate about environmentalism? Like, you know, my I guess you know, I my parents weren't really like sciencey at all. They weren't really like um, you know outdoorsy that much. But I just I feel like so. Um, like this is my, my place. Like I, I feel mm -hmm. really compelled to share my knowledge. And also part of it is to, you know, what were you touching upon earlier where, you know, you have this life, you have one life, right? Like when you, every single day, what you do matters. And if I can spend every single day doing something that I enjoy, I'm going to be a happier person in the world. And I'm going to be able, and what I enjoy is taking things out of that thrift stream, taking things out of that landfill, um, you know, harvesting things before they wind up there. There's so much value in that. I think that's where I kind of came from with it, with the whole, you're poor thing. Like Mm -hmm. there's so much value in the things that in our culture, we just think, oh, that's trash. Oh, that's last year's style, whatever. Like, oh, low rise jeans, who wears those anymore? Well, you don't have to wear the jeans. You could, you know, use the fabric to, to create something different or, you know, restyle them in such a way that they're more appealing to whatever style sense you might have. So I think that is kind of like, kind of got me in there. And then I started learning about all the, the, um, the real need to, assess like you know it's like it's kind of like there people don't realize that they're throwing valuable valuable things away like it's like a gold mine that you know it's just sitting there waiting for people to use yeah so you actually just answered one of the big questions i had for you is like how did you get to be so passionate and and to see this as like a core value of your company so that's well, yeah, I bet, I mean, that's kind of it, you know, the other thing, I mean, you know, going back, like when I had my production company and I had my 40 employees of those 40 people, I, 25 of them worked at home and, um, yeah. you know, I did everything by the book. So like they had, a, you know, they had to make at least minimum wage. My goal was for them to make more than minimum, way more than minimum wage. 
and I had like in the state of Massachusetts because of a company that um, was called Country Curtains. They employed people in their homes years before I did, and they had sort of set a precedent and had this like system worked out so that their employees could be at home caring for their young children or aging parents or what for whatever reason they could work at home and also make a living that supported their families and so to have had that opportunity to show these predominantly women most of my employees were women that you know I remember I started my business my production company started in New York State and these guys and ties came out from like the economic development council or wherever they come from you know they're gonna like oh we can help you know small business whatever whatever and they were like you you know you're employing unemployable people and i'm like how could somebody be unemployable honestly like how how what first of all why do you even use that term and secondly like everyone has a capacity to contribute every single person and for someone to be deemed as unable to contribute just broke my heart i was like yeah. You tell somebody that they're unable to contribute, they're never going to be able to contribute. Like, so these women that work for me, a lot of them were deemed unemployable. And, you know, yeah. over the years of working with me, I just saw like these beautiful butterflies emerge from, I love that, you know, people who, you know, didn't have teeth or like, didn't, you know, I don't have any ideas. I have no idea. Like just couldn't make eye contact with me because I was their boss. We're like turned into these amazing self-confident, like very valuable employees that were, I mean, I still see them, you know, I still, I, I, like I said, I, I live kind of like where I've lived most of my life. So, um, you know, it's just a pleasure to see them in the world today. Cause they're, they're not the same people that walked in the door and it was, I didn't do anything special. I just offered them an opportunity. And I feel like that is the people component. It's the fabric component. It's the making process component. It's just giving that thing that somebody thought was trash an opportunity, you know, yeah. you take a piece of trashy fabric and you give it an opportunity to become something not trashy the people, the making process, ow, oh, you know, hand sewing, who does that? Well, it's actually possible, right? So, um, and it all probably goes back to flipping my parents off and being like, you know, you're telling me this is nothing. Let me show you how it is. Let me show how it is. Like finding the value in things that people think are not valuable. Yeah. You know, I mean, that really resonates with my work. Like I, um, I have a longstanding series now called the junk mail migration series, where it's really, it's, it's capturing junk mail out of the, the waste cycle. And I developed this process to stabilize the pH and everything. And it's what I create these paintings on. And then the, the paintings and the subject matter is all about, uh, it, it, it's not even like it, the thing that I, I like about what you're saying so much is it's not that you're saying like, you're wrong for doing this shame on you. It's more like, be aware that this is the consequence, be aware that this is what's happening. And like, for me, my junk mail migration paintings about the series of bird is all about like, be aware that by relying on things like disposable paper products, we are not going to have as many migratory birds in our backyards because where they nest, where they breed, where they live, where they, the area they need is diminishing each year. And as that diminishes up north in the boreal forest ring, we see less of our favorite, the things that we think make our landscape and ecology are like ours is it's kind of evaporating or at least yeah. changing substantially. And so it's like, be aware. And so like, I love capturing things before they even become trash yeah. and using them and give it free. It's like when the idea of upcycling came into being, when was that? It was about 2009 ish, right? Maybe yeah, a little well, before like, that. Yeah. Upcycling was, yeah. Well, I started in all 20, about recycling. Yeah. Recycling. Well, you know, it took me a long time until actually kind of recently to understand that there's actually a difference between the recycling yeah. and upcycling. And like, you know, upcycling is when you add value and recycling You're, is when something gets reused, 
Right. Yeah. And it's like, well, you think about like recycling when you recycle plastic bags, for instance, it's almost like a slow decline. Right. Where it's like what you recycle it to is of lower quality than the thing Mm -hmm. that it's made out of. Right. Or when you upcycle, you're elevating in the waste stream where you're rising it up above where it previously was. And that's what I love that like craft and art can absolutely do that in a way that I think other industries can't because they just, I don't know. It's really beautiful. Well, it's a creative process. It's a creative process. It's not mechanical. It's not, um, it's not rote. It's not, um, you know, it's not possible to do like, it's, it's all one-offs. You know, it's all what else you can't have mass production upcycled product. I mean, I've done a couple of projects with larger volume textile waste generating companies that are able, you know, because their, their scrap is consistent. You can produce with a consistent material, which then sure. reduces the variance between, um, you know, you know, you can make multiples of the same. So, I mean, I did that with my business too. When I had my production company, I was able to, to produce multiples, but it was, they were all real, actually different. You know what I mean? Like the Mm -hmm. the texture of the blue sweater in the blue and green blanket was not the same on every single blanket. They were all one of a kind. So yeah, I think that that's actually a really cool thing to think about how people are, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a, I, I feel like there's this connection that's growing. It's like the, the world's neurons are kind of firing together and there's like these pathways being made as a collective kind of human brain on the planet where if you cut down the forests, your bird feeders are going to be empty. You know, yes. if you throw out all your clothing, there's going to be this mountain of like rotting clothing in the ocean and your, you know, the platypus are going to die because they're going to be like eating like, you know, H and M, you know, fake plastic velvet skirts for not even the platypus, even things like cod and tuna, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. And it's wild. Oh no, I know. It's It's, totally wild. Yeah. 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 (laughs) (laughs) It's well, yeah. I, okay. I have a couple more questions that okay. I want to ask you. And I feel like I've taken up a lot of your time today, which has been so enjoyable. Oh, um, and so there was one, one thing. So we're going to totally detour here. Sure. Uh, Cause I just, I want to know the answer to this question. And it's also to give a little bit of continuity to the entire series. I'm going to show you something. Okay. And I want, so this was your project in the book. Let me see mm-hmm. if I can. Oh, here we go. I just wish that thing fit me. Right. Okay. Well, so that almost answers my question exactly. Is like, if you were to contribute to mend it better again, would you contribute the same thing, or would you want to do something different? Well, I love that piece, and actually, that mm-hmm. sweatshirt is a, it's a it's a sweatshirt that was encrusted in it's a red sweatshirt encrusted in gold sequins. sequins which I mean, yes, what could be better, honestly. Um, <laughs> it was a kid size, you know, I was like trying to squeeze into it. And my kids were like, mom, that's mine. And I'm like, "Mm." so I would make something different simply because I really enjoy the creative process. And I would like to come up with a new idea. I also feel like there's kind of been a growth in our uh, sort of a collective growth in the world of fashion and you know, people are more willing to invest maybe more time. And I think that project that I submitted was quite, quite simple. It was like, an, you know, if you have a garment that you love and it doesn't have pockets, you can put pockets on it and it's, you know, they don't have to match. They can kind of be like a little wonky and be cool. So I think I would do something maybe, you know, I think one of the ways my aesthetic has kind of morphed over the years is I've become a little bit more subtle. Like mm. I, you know, and I see that, I think, there's two reasons for that. One is that I feel like people are more comfortable generally if the, their clothing is not the first thing that people talk to them about. Mm. You know, people like to kind of like, like, like my daughter at the dance, like they kind of like to sort of not be like, Hey, I'm a really creative dresser over here, but to be like more subtle and like to know that their clothing is handmade or mended or you know, um, refit for them. Um, and I also feel like over time, my own 
um, aesthetic, my own way of dressing. Well, it's also, you know, I've been in the house for two years, so <laughs> I'm not really sure like once I get out and about if it'll still hold true, but you know, I'm just not, I'm not that, um, I'm not that of a flamboyant dresser as I have been in the past. I feel like eh, it, my life has changed a bunch. You know, I used to be at shows. Mm -hmm. I used to be around a lot of like professionals and in places where, you know, I was presenting myself as a business person. And seriously, now I have literally been home. I am wearing pants. I can prove to you. I do have pants on. They're not plaid <laughs> and they're not pajama pants, but, um, you know, I don't know. My plaid pants are like my favorite <laughs> pants still. I feel like every decade I get a new style of plaid pants. <laughs> my husband was making fun of me because I found the best pair. I call them action slacks. They're like plaid wool pants that are kind of flared with a cuff. And they like, I put them on at the thrift store and they fit me like they were made for me. And oh my, my kids gosh. teasing me, telling me that he, that I look like I was wearing my pajama pants. Cause I have kind of a thing about like people wearing pajama pants outside. Like just don't do that put on clothes like you're outdoors but um <laughs> so you know who am I to judge honestly wear whatever you want but um yeah so I think I'd probably make something different maybe something a little more complex something that people could learn a little bit more from but I also feel like there's a real value in making something super simple that someone who has never even considered the idea of like refitting something or mm -hmm. adding a detail that could really help them enjoy that garment more you know, something that they can yeah. just do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I think too, one of the things that's really changed since the book came out that I've noticed is just like, and maybe this is a little bit about how we've both decided to pivot what we're doing in our businesses. Um, back in 2005, 2010, uh, there was not this like repository of patterns on the internet like there is today. And so like, I think it was really vital and good that we all contributed and that, and put out all of this how to make things because I think that has really embodied or in, enabled a lot of people of future generations of our generation of the world whatever to be able to just look up whatever they want to make and somebody's probably made some variation and posted about it online somewhere that they now have access to. And so now it's like, almost like what you were saying about what you would contribute to the book is that there's more nuance and complexity that people are now searching for. Like I think 10, 15 years ago, it was like, how do I even do this? Mm -hmm. And now it's like this more complex nuance. How do I make a living at this? How mm -hmm. do I make this sustainably? Mm -hmm. How do I keep my craft stash from overwhelming my entire life? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like all those totally. kinds of things. I think that's so yeah. true. And it's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that um, before, like just the, the ability to, like, there's a lot of information out there, right? And I, again, I think that the, the pandemic really kind of upped the ante with that quite a bit yes. because people were home and they did have time and, you know, it's been a really interesting last couple of years when I first, when the pandemic first hit, I do this thing every couple of years, I get, I do a scrap box challenge and it's my mm -hmm. way of, it's my kind of like sort of um, self-serving way of being zero waste where mm -hmm. I can ship all my scrap out <laughs> to people who volunteer. I want to do that on um, Facebook. And we do a scrap box challenge. And the, this challenge is you take this little box of scrap and you make something cool out of it, right? Well, I ship yeah. those boxes out on my mother's birthday is March 9th. This was whatever it was. What was two years ago? 19? Yeah. Yeah. I shipped them out on March 9th. And on March 13th was when my kids came home from school for two weeks because there was a pandemic going on. And here we are yeah. two years later. So those people, we did like live Zoom stuff with the scrap box challenge and that was so needed. Like every single person in the scrap box challenge, there were 62 people. They needed that. They needed yeah. each other. They needed to have this place to go where they could see people. And like, we were all freaking out. We didn't know what the heck was going on. I mean, oh my I gosh, know. every, every day was unprecedented. Remember that? That was like the word of the year. Oh, this is unprecedented. I'm like, yeah, it is. Pivot. <laughs> it's like the, you know, you had like the two-step and past generations or the 
the twist. This is like the pandemic pivot. <laughs> I felt <laughs> like it was the dance we were all doing. <laughs> yeah, totally. Even still, I'm like, oh, totally. I have to use the word pivot again in regards to my business and life. I'm just gonna yeah. Like, yeah, I know. But it's true. Yeah. It's not it's an unprecedented pivot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's unprecedented times. <laughs> yeah. So, so but terrible. you know, out of oh all that, gosh. and this it sort of speaks back to the whole like um finding value. Like, you know, I don't want to diminish anybody's loss because I know that the world has had such a hard time. There's been so much grief and just loss and like yeah. ugh, like just ah, uh, just such hard times for so many people, right? Like certainly don't want to I don't think anybody's walked through this without losing somebody they love yeah or having someone they love deeply affected yeah 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 so you know with that like where's the good part where's the blessing you know and I feel like there are blessings and we can we can you know I think it's always healthy to look at what we think of as just like the most upsetting horrific things and just like where the, what what came what is good that came from this and I feel like awareness of environmental impact I feel like the what you were talking about about like just de-stashing getting rid of all that excess that that people became aware of how much they have right and like yeah and people came together on and, yeah. you know even if it was virtually like the ladies in my scrap box challenge like just really like bonding with each other and knowing that like we are here for each other we're all here it's just one little yeah. planet like i don't care what color you are i don't care who you voted for i don't care what gender you are i don't care all i know is that today together we can solve problems and yeah not together we're just going to create more of them so i don't know i'm all about i'm a solutionary that's my new word <laughs> <laughs> i like it i like it a lot so a more easy question. What's it, what's in your mending basket right now? Oh my goodness. Well, right now there's two things that I'm working on. Um, I'm working on my set for the um, Rags to Riches Summit. So I'm making yeah. this big backdrop that's all made out of denim. I want it to be sim- like simple, but I also need it to be recycled. So it can't be like super patchy. It needs to like be subtle behind me like you can see behind me is not subtle it's a little confusing as far as like <laughs> being able to like what is that oh yeah that's a desk there's probably a few dirty coffee cups back there but not really actually but um I mean I had a few I, I was like oh I better yeah you just away. Out of sight. <laughs> like, just over there <laughs> that's the great thing about frame. zoom it's like there's this whole other world you guys can't see um <laughs> but no it's actually not terrible um so I'm working on the backdrop and I'm also, um, I'm doing some printing. These are the, um, for early birds who get the um, early bird tickets that we're sending out these patches with the intention of them being affixed to a tote bag or a t-shirt or, you know, it's a textile recycling summit. So we don't want to be sending out a new textile. Stuff. Yeah. Right. So um, <laughs> good call. <laughs> yeah. So, and then I'm doing this, I'm doing this jacket where I'm affixing this to the back of this kind of cool, like, I wish I could. I actually want me to show it to you. Yeah, I would love to see it. Um, it's so how can of, people how can people sign up for the Rags to Riches, Riches Summit? The Rags to Riches Summit is um, actually early bird tickets are on sale right now. And you pro- I mean, I, people are probably going to be listening to this later, but um, right now is in March 2022. And um, our tickets are available until the 17th. Those are early bird tickets. Okay. And then it's crispina.eco is my website. So if you're listening to this, like, in the future sometime i'm imagining that maybe the summit will become an annual event so cool. if it's not 2022 and you want to participate get involved or attend you can just go to crispina.eco which is just my first name with dot eco um and you can learn more about what i do there um but if you are listening to this soon um this is a jacket that i'm working on and it has the patch on there okay. and i'm a big I love to hand sew. So this is all, um, it's hard to tell on zoom, but it's all, um, just stitched with some, you know, sparkly, um, embroidery floss. <laughs> yes. Kind of like a crow. And I have, um, yeah. um I'm going to do like some velvet and embellish it all up. And then I think that this will probably either, if I fall in love with it, I might keep it. But if I don't, I mean, even if I fall in love with it, I might wind up, um, 
giving this to some lucky winner at the summit. We're, we're doing all kinds of fun gamification at the summit. So there'll be prizes for different things and people will get points for like attending different booths and there'll be vendor booths and all sorts of fun things. So um, that's my intention, although I'm kind of becoming attached. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I find that through the creative process, you either become intensely attached to a thing and that makes it very difficult to sell or you like go through this process and it's like almost a birth by fire and it's like you just whatever you hate it by the end like get it out of my life <laughs> yeah it's really funny you know <laughs> my creative process like i always make things to sell like i don't i very very rarely make things i i the number of things i've yeah. actually made intended to have for me, I could probably count on one hand. Like I don't yeah. make stuff for myself. I make stuff for my kids. I make stuff for my house, my family, whatever. But like, I don't think like, oh, I need a new dress. I should make myself a dress. And I actually should make myself a dress because I'm going to be on camera in front of hundreds of people. And, you know, I can't be wearing like, you know, I mean, I could wear whatever I want, but you know, it'd be nice to have things right. that kind of match with the, the event. So. I know I had that same mindset. I remember the very first like big public event I did was, uh, it was like 2007, 2008. I did the blog her conference in Navy Pier on a panel and I spent two days flat out sewing a dress out of vintage bed seat sheets because I was like, I'll be darned if I'm going to show up and do this public thing. <laughs> Right. And like not me wearing something that I made that's a craft leftovers. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what we do. Right. And that's, that's just like perfect. how I'm wired. I don't know why. <laughs> well, it's because, you know, when you're, when you're like some, like you're Coca Cola, you put the billboard at the show, right? Like that's what you do. Well, yeah. well not Coca Cola. And so what do you do? You show people, you teach by example. And that's what I yeah. tell my students a lot is like, you know, you don't have to have a business. You don't have to have a billboard. If you're wearing something or using something that has made, been created with what people think is trash and people see it and go, oh, oh, what is, oh, look at that thing. That's beautiful. That somebody spent their time. Where did you get that? Right. Yeah. Like, and like, what's the, and then, yeah, it's, it it's, opens that dialogue. Yeah. And a and really it, beautiful it creates, way. Like, it's, it's like, yeah, it's, it creates dialogue. It creates uh, imagination. It creates mm -hmm. a new way of seeing thrift stores for me. Like people, you're yeah. never going to walk into a thrift store and see the same thing you did before. Once you took one, Heck of the no. five, you know, so. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, sure. And then I do have okay. to get my daughter, but yeah. Well, no, that's why I totally asked before I even <laughs> asked it. <laughs> okay. So Parting note, um, do you have like a other, of course, than the rags to riches, but uh, which of course we're going to list and mention, do you have a resource or, or advice that you'd give to someone starting a new creative business, you know, kind of just like getting started on that path? Like what would you Yeah, tell them? what I would tell them. Um, well, I think there's two kinds of people in the world. And I think that there's some people who do a lot of planning and thinking and planning and thinking and planning and thinking. And then there's other people who are more like me who really don't plan a whole lot of anything. They just do it. And if you want to have a business, it's never going to be the perfect time. You're never going to think you're ready. And you just got to do it and try it and experiment and change the parts you don't like and roll with the ones you do. And if, you know, I make lists, I do like the do differently and went well. And so like after mm -hmm. every thing I do, if it's a craft fair, if it's a new product release, whatever it is, I always go back and look, what did I like about it? What do I want to change? And then do those things. Don't do the things that don't work. Do do the things that do work. And uh, yeah, it's like having a baby, right? Like people, you know, I remember my sister, Scott, like she's a teacher, right? So she wanted to have her daughter like right at the end of the school year so she could have the summer off and then take maternity leave. I'm like... I don't know. I never even thought about that. Like, I mean, I'm not a teacher, so it didn't really, but like, you have to just know that it's, it's okay to experiment. Um, I do think while I'm saying that it's really important to have your own 
design aesthetic, you know, you have to kind of develop that on your own. You don't want to be too influenced by social media or what you see out in the world already happening. You want to develop your skill set. You want to develop your aesthetic and make so that you stand out and you're not just yeah. somebody who gets overlooked because it kind of has a similarity to other things that are out there. Um, yeah. So those two things just, in, yeah. yeah. So find your voice and just jump in, right? Yeah. <laughs> sometimes yeah, jump yeah. in to find your voice. <laughs> right. As long as you got your action slacks on, you should be all set up. All right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh man. Well, I got to say, I, there are so many questions more that I want to ask you. And I hope that someday we can get back on the line together and have a chat again. Cause I, I feel the surface is just scratched and, uh, you know, thank you. Thank you for yeah, sharing you're your welcome. story and, and your experiences and, and just your time and everything. Yeah. You, oh, you're welcome, Kristen. I would love to, um, to revisit a conversation with you and, you know, and just see, I think that, um, there's a, there's a, real need for people to connect with um people like you and people like me that are you know we're on these parallel paths that are you know they're like hey kristen hey Chris <laughs> you know, yeah like, exactly you no, know, no i it's, it's cool to connect so um yeah i'd love that and thank you so much for including me and i look forward bet. to hearing it when it's ready to roll well and i look forward to the rags for riches it would you call it a conference or a symposium I'm calling it or? A summit. it's a, a summit? summit okay yeah and um we have 24 um presenters from all across the spectrum so geez awesome. will be with us um fab scrap uh like and then you know lrle which is a new i mean not new just young um to brand from la i mean there's just a gamut there's and they're all super inspiring uh all textile upcyclers so um that's super, cool super cool yeah. i'm looking forward to going <laughs> oh thank you thank you so much yeah, yeah. and of um, if you have any questions afterward you need info or whatever just reach out i'll be happy to help you okay cool thank you so much you have a You're good welcome, day person. thanks you too thanks for for chatting bye. yeah bye thanks so much for stopping by don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. It really is the best way to help others find craft leftovers too. Until next time.